welcome. Good, uh, good morning. Uh, great to uh, see. If you look at look into the uh, the chat section, I recommended two, what I think are really great books, uh, just providing a spiritual foundation for our marriages. Uh, and, and some of the things that we talked about last week and this week come from some of our reading in that in those uh, those marriage books. So you and me forever by Francis and Lisa Chan and the meaning of marriage by Timothy Keller. Really good, solid biblical uh, teaching to, to, to root and ground our marriages. And so we'll, we'll kind of take off from there. But before that, I'm going to lead a prayer. Let's, let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, salvation. Thank you mm -hmm. for the, the gift of marriage and relationships that we have. And uh, Father, thank you for community and the mm -hmm. chance to meet together like this. And even as we've been talking, God, I do pray for our world. Mm -hmm. I pray for our families. I pray for our friends and coworkers and neighbors and others. We are all experiencing a very difficult and challenging time. And help us with your grace and your goodness and your kindness and your heart to help people around us. And Father, we do pray that with uh, wisdom, discernment mm -hmm. of our scientists and politicians, we will be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but Father, even as we need to focus, God help us to realize that uh, there is uh, there is an eternity that we need to also keep in mind. And uh, but God uh, bless this time, Father. As we even talk about grace and the gospel and and uh, in our marriage, Father, thank you again for Jesus mm -hmm. and bringing us salvation. And so bless this time. We love you and praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I want you to uh, kind of think and to yourself about this. If when I say, "What is the gospel?" You know, I know we have we have our answers that come quickly. What is the gospel to you, and how has it transformed your life and your marriage? Um, in First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Verse 1, Paul says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, and if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. you know, and it goes on, and he says he passed it on with first importance, and talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And, you know, last week I, I, I was sharing, you know, Joyce and I, on August 7th, 1982, got married. We did. And that changed our lives. Uh, August 25th, 1987, you know, five years later, we got baptized into Jesus, and that changed our eternal destiny by receiving the gospel and, and aggressively taking hold of it that that changed where we are going. You know, last week we talked about this idea of, of, of our marriages living in light of eternity and the fact that we have for us. That, that, that grace, that gospel now shapes our marriage. And, and Paul goes on to say later on, you know, that this gospel was not without effect. That, uh, no, I worked harder than all the others. And, you know, it's, I know there's a lot of confusion and a lot of discussion as to what grace and how it should motivate us. And we don't earn our salvation by any means, but we do respond in grace to that salvation. There is some things we do as a result. There are things that I do in my marriage now as a result of the grace that I have received through Jesus. When Paul speaks of grace, and in, in, you know, it was not just simply a religious word to them who were the hearers in, in, in the New Testament. Grace uh, and it was, was filled throughout their culture, and it had to do with, with a response from the gods. This is how they receive it. Someone received grace, favor from the gods, and then in kind returned, gave that to other people. 
grace or favor to, to, to help those who were in need. And then the receiver responded to that grace. And we'll talk about this a little bit. It's this incredible dance. And Joyce will share some things here. Uh, yeah, I think it's important that we <clears throat> try and understand the concept of grace from the Eastern eye perspective, um, rather than just our Western view. Uh, we, we typically most often see grace as something that we receive. It's like a gift um, and, it, and it, it's just given to us. Um, and it ends there in our thinking. It just is like, wow, thank you so much. You know, we may express the words thank you, but that's not at all um, the biblical understanding and the cultural understanding of the time. Right. Uh, you can think how, how clearly it's not our culture because several years ago, there was this idea of paying it forward. And, um, you know, people would, would drive through a coffee um, shop, whatever, Tim Hortons, and they'd pay for the person coming behind them. And it started this pay it forward trend. But that's honestly, this idea of grace is a pay it forward mentality. Right. Um, and it's not new. And, you know, as, as shocking as that was in our culture, uh, it was the biblical expectation that a grace received was a grace, um, paid forward. And uh, I, I think it's really changed how Sean and I even study the Bible, study it with other people, but study it with ourselves. And it's opened our eyes to how we even see stories more clearly in the scriptures by people's response. There was always an action that accompanied it. And so gratitude always came mm -hmm. with a pay it forward um, action. And I was just reading this week, it makes me think of um, if you're familiar with the story nearing the end of David's life, he counts his mighty fighting men and, um, and then he's, he's punished for it because he becomes conscience stricken. He didn't need to do it. And God gives him a choice of three things and he chooses a plague from God. Um, you know, and then David obviously is stricken even in pain because of that, but he's preparing to build an altar um, and he's going to get this threshing floor. And of course, the man who owns it wants to give it to the king. And, you know, David actually, um, <clears throat> excuse me, says in 2 Samuel 24, the king replied, no, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. And that, that you know, encapsulates this idea that when there's been a sacrifice given on our behalf, like grace, um, there is this expectation. So even though David was king and perhaps entitled to anything he said he wanted, he had that deep understanding that he would not take it for free, but he wanted to sacrifice something that cost him something. You know, Psalm 32 says, blessed or happy is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. <clears throat> Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him. And, and again, certainly as, as Christians, we, we understand and appreciate how amazing it is to have our sins forgiven, to, to have them not no longer counted against us. And the response to grace in Psalm 116, what shall I give back to the Lord for all of his gifts to me? And, and Again, in, in, a, in a New Testament cultural understanding, grace was always meant to be returned with gratitude and action. And as we begin to think about our marriages, I want us to think about grace in what we have received and how we now treat one another in our marriage, especially when it comes to challenges and difficulties or disagreements that we have. Can we in turn respond to God's grace and have grace towards one another. And it, it, it always meant that we were, you know, again, the New Testament understanding and, and cultural understanding that it, when you received grace, you are now faithful with it. You were dependable, you were reliable, you were passing it forward. It was, it was good news that you had to share. And so I say, you wanna be happy in your marriage, be reminded of the gospel. 
be reminded of the of what you took and received and grabbed hold of and enjoyed back then when you became a Christian and as you enjoy it now and let it kind of bathe your marriage with grace and the gospel and, and I love again if you, you read some of the, the 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 Roman and Greek understanding of grace it, it, it was described as this beautiful dance that again that God gave someone and, and then they in turn gave it to someone else and as if to hold hands the receiver took it and then responded with it and kind of holding hands together they would have this dance and, and it was described very beautifully and, and it was it was expected that you would not kind of you would not fail to respond to that right. and and, and the, the dance continued and certainly that's what god wants us to do in our marriage in in philippians a passage we won't read but we know very very well in philippians 2 3 to 8 we get this we, we see jesus who being in the very nature of god did not consider equality with god something to be grasped and he took the the nature of a servant so much so that he died for us obviously that's that's grace that that jesus would leave heaven that he would voluntarily say you know i will go and i will die i mean that is grace mm -hmm. and that that we are moved by jesus's sacrifice but we also see in that a humility and, and what did we do when we responded to jesus we responded in humility i i need your grace i need your forgiveness <clears throat> i desire a relationship with you and, and so Again, these are the foundations and the footings of our marriage. And, and some of today, it's, it's, it is simply a reminder. Are we continuing to build on these footings, on this foundation? Um, do nothing out of selfish ambition, but in humility. Again, this position of grace mm -hmm. <laughs> that you consider others better than yourselves. I am not king. We'll talk about this in a, in a few minutes you know we we have a we have some challenges in our understanding of leadership and submission and some husbands feel that they are kings because they are the leaders you you submit to me well <laughs> jesus quite frankly says i will submit to god i will make myself nothing i don't grasp this place I don't use this position for my advantage. That's literally what it means. And so Jesus takes this position of submission to God. And what's the key? His humility. What is the key in us is humility. And again, if we can use this dance, mm -hmm. it is our understanding of, of, of God and who he is and, and are responding to grace and humility and we 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 pay it forward we pay it forward with one another and, and we we can't we don't take advantage of one another i i submit ephesians tells us to submit to one another we 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 respond with this grace and again our, our thinking sometimes is and if i do this Joyce will I, I need I need to stand up for myself I, I need to I need to be the king I need to let her know that that who, who what my role is and so we play the I'll we, remind we, him play, of David. we play the leader card we play you know submit and and I'll just say when we play that card I think we've lost we've already lost and, and so even in our marriages, again, we we got to be careful to not allow the the uh, the culture to shape right. who we who we are. And I believe the reason Jesus is is so convicting is that he re he removes all of my excuses, mm -hmm. all of my reasons to stand and and take a stand and 
say, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to lead. And he says, no, you make yourself a servant. You don't hold on to the things that you think will give you priority and status. You make yourself nothing. And again, what do we see in Jesus? You know, when the rubber met the road for him, when he knew he needed to give grace to us and, 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 and go to the cross the night before he dies, he's wrestling. He's literally wrestling with God's plan. And he says, you know, I'm not sure of this anymore. He was talking about it for, for, for years prior, but now he's, he's saying, I'm, I'm not sure of this, but God, not my will, but your will be done. And then the Hebrew writer says, with loud cries and tears, he offered that, but he was heard, what? Uh, for his reverent submission, the surrender. And, and again, if we look at Ephesians chapter five, and I, I just refer to it, for you because we don't have time to read it but verse 21 says submit to one another out of reverence for christ and of course it says why submit to your husband and we fail to see the first verse that i just read and we go right to this one and then it goes on talks about submitting the wives submitting as as the church does to christ and then it says husbands love your wives just as christ loved and, and you know, that's, first of all, submitting to one another. We, again, we, we, we miss that. And, and that, but that's Christ's example. And when are you sharing? Okay. <laughs> Just trying to coordinate our uh, sharing here. Uh, as, uh, as a husband, I'm told to love just as Christ loved. You know, I, I, I try to take care of my body. I, 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 try to eat properly i try to exercise like i was sharing earlier i'm trying to do some some even some yoga to to provide flexibility and 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 things that i would never admit years ago but hey i'm, I'm getting old i don't really care anymore let's just let's try to be healthy um you know i i love flavor in my life you know spice and Thank you, Tony, for the hot sauce. It's half gone. It's half gone already. It, uh, <laughs> I love it. I love spice. It, and it, it just, uh, it, it, contrary to what other people think, it brings flavor to food. It, 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 it just uh, it enlightens everything. But my purpose is not to feed myself. My purpose is actually to try to, to help Joyce. My wife is married to Jesus. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I'm trying to be Jesus. We get it. That's, that's, <clears throat> that needs to be my mindset. And so Jesus submitted himself. He humbled himself. You know, the, this scripture talks about washing with water through the word. And if you really look at what this kind of meant, um, kind of in, in, in context of Greek language, you know, there were mikvahs that, that people went, the Jews would go down and, and bathe themselves or baptize themselves. But you actually washed yourself for purification prior to getting baptized. <laughs> and so what this meaning is, as a husband, I am literally preparing Joyce and purifying her and washing her with water so that she can meet her bridegroom, Jesus. So that she can be kind of have that relationship, that pure relationship with Jesus. Now, goodness, when I think of it on that scale, man, I'm humbled. And I'm humbled by my leadership, or I'm humbled at times of my lack of leadership, of, of what, how am I washing her? How am I immersing her? How am I kind of plunging her, flooding her with, 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 with God in, in my relationship with God? And again, that's got to be the fuel. Husbands, guys, we, we've got to get our fuel from God. Um, 
we love, I think we shared this last week, we love to share scriptures that, that, that we are reading and, and we're studying and there's this dialogue and conversation that, that just causes us to be immersed in God's word and inspired and, and, and lifted up and it, it causes us to think differently throughout our day or change thinking throughout our day. And I, I love Christ's sacrifice that he would just, he would give everything. He feeds and he cares for it just as Christ does the church. And it's about being humble, responding to God's grace. And, and, you know, if you know the story of the unmerciful servant, he has this incredible debt of grace. His master forgives him. Mm -hmm. He goes off and he goes to another person who owes much less. And he basically demands that he, he pay him his debt and chokes him and throws him in jail. And, and, and obviously the master hears about that and, and just is indignant that that would ever happen. And I say, God forbid that in my marriage, I receive this incredible grace, this debt forgiven, but I can't, I can't forgive even in my closest, closest relationship. And so I'm meant to respond to grace. I'm meant to be humble. I'm meant to be bathed in, in, uh, and, and respond and submit as Christ submits and, and, and meet Joyce's needs. And Joyce is going to share more about submission here. Okay. Uh, if we can think of what we're talking about here in light of this dance of grace, um, you can see how it's a back and forth in tandem sharing with each other. <clears throat> There's a submission um, from those of us who've chosen to make Jesus Lord. There is that submission um, individually uh, to Jesus Lordship. But it, even as disciples, those of us who are, you know, participating in this class as disciples, um, we're in the context of the church in submission with one another out of reverence to the leadership of Jesus. And you know, I think <clears throat> there's a, a whole level of, of people's ability to dance. Um, they even have, you know, <laughs> dance shows. Um, <clears throat> I dare say I would never, ever be on one of those dance floors. Um, but we all have different rhythms. It's okay if our rhythm is different. It's okay if we... Some have none. <laughs> so, that's not fair, honey. Um, I didn't... No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we know. We know. <clears throat> but regardless of our ability to dance with each other, there is this spiritual concept of dancing uh, of, of, with grace. And so when we look at submission and love and respect, <clears throat> uh, as Sean was just talking about the, the love, it's incredibly a high calling yeah. for the man's leadership to be that of Christ um, in his sacrifice to the church and for our salvation. And so we both respond with grace, but also, you know, it's a servant leadership. And so leading in love is one of his own submission to Jesus, but it's a place of leadership that then God calls us. And life is fashioned with leaders. Uh, and we're called to submit throughout the whole scriptures, uh, regardless of marriage. Uh, we submit to governing authorities. We submit to bosses. We submit to parents. Um, so submission is not something that's intended to be um, humiliating or taken advantage right. of. We're not talking about it in the biblical concept of that. Um, but our culture, obviously today, it hears submission and it's like, wow, um, you know, it, it's an anti-movement. But it's transformational when we truly understand the biblical context of it. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, when there is an just a need for surrendering or submitting to something, it should hopefully be in light of, okay, here's the decision that we've got to make. We both feel different things, but they're not wrong decisions. They're ultimately going to be this tension of how do we decide? 
that's when I would surrender as a wife to my husband's leadership, trusting that he's going to um, choose what the best thing would be for our family. Um, but it, submission is, is obviously it is a conscious choice that we make. We're called to do it, but it's a conscious um, choice for us to accept and regard the role or position that God has placed upon the husband in our marriage. And it's a conscious decision to, you know, yield or resign or surrender to that leadership. Um, and so, you know, as a, as a teacher, students need to respond. We look at Jesus that way. You know, the Bible describes Mary sitting at her feet. There's just this, again, this disposition of humility that comes with the leadership of love, but also with the, um, the sense of submission to our husband's leadership. Uh, and then the other one, um, you know, Paul writes at the very end, wives respect your husbands. And again, this respect is this position of honor or, um, you know, a reverence toward that person's position. That's why we're called to respect the governing authorities. Or even when I referred to David at um, Aruna's threshing floor, he wanted to give it to the king right. out of probably honor and respect as the king. Um, but David obviously wanted to pay something. He wanted it to cost him something. But, um, you know, respect, if you think about it in our culture, is getting less and less and less among every level um and 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 so the younger generations coming up don't even have the model unless we specifically um teach it to our children and those around it but it doesn't take away from god's um expectation of it it doesn't diminish the respect you know and giving honor to whom honor is due and simply because of the role that god has given as a leader, there is this place of respect that we put upon it. And that takes a lot of submission to God and trust in God that um, God's plan is going to work when we function with this dance of grace. Um, you know, I think in our homes, it's a great testimony to the world today when we see a wife respect her husband. Um, it's a sad testimony when you read about, you know, many marriages that hurt and um, struggle because a man feels more respected in his job, in his career, right. than he's actually respected at home. And because it is against God's plan, it really does hurt and diminish, you know, the bond and strength that the marriage is intended to have. So it is an opportunity, you know, for us to honor and glorify God as we show um, and model that uh, in our marriages. Um, let me see. And I think, uh, lastly, it's just if we're practicing this dance of grace in our marriage with submission, submission to each other as a disciple, but in the leadership of our home and the respect and love that we show each other, it is our way of constantly giving back and, and, and you know, forwarding um, the gratitude that we receive and, and the gratitude that we feel to our spouses that we're able to always continue in this dance of grace. And as we practice it, just like dancing, um, we can hopefully improve uh, our ability to dance, but it's also, it improves the grace that we display in our marriage with each other. Yeah. And again, you know, some of this is easier said than done when in the moments of conflict, we, you know, we're wrestling with ourselves. We're, we're wrestling with what we're feeling. We're wrestling with what's, what's going on, what the other person has said. And, and again, we're trying to provide some principles to at least allow us to stop. And I'll speak from a husband's standpoint. If, if there there is some conflict and I'm feeling some pushback and I don't feel respected and I don't feel like she is hearing me. I may have to go step back and go, what, what have I done that has not been loving or what am I not doing that is not loving towards her? 
that is caring for her and feeding her and helping her be without stain or wrinkle or blemish. And therefore, not, oh, not simply looking at what she has been doing, but what, what have I been doing or what have I not been doing as, as kind of as Christ's mentality. And it begins to shape. And, and, and hopefully, <laughs> again, I don't have the unmerciful servant's mentality. I, I, have, a, I have a humble mentality of goodness. Gosh, God, you've, you've forgiven me. Let, let's, let's, let's reconcile. Let's make sure that this relationship, this dance continues. Let's continue to hold hands and enjoy the grace that God has, has given us. And, and so similarly as, as wives, it, it, it is to submit, is to take, take a place of, of, of understanding as Jesus did, <clears throat> that I will serve. And, and so we, we continue this beautiful dance in our marriages. Um, and I, I, I'm not saying that it's never going to be without conflict, because I, I think all marriages, they're, they're, in fact, there, there needs to be some conflict. And what I mean by that, there, needs, there will be some disagreements. We, we have opinions and thoughts and oh, feelings. <laughs> And that will get expressed and we, we, need to, we need to hear one another out. But that's the key. If I'm loving as a husband, as Christ would have, then I would hear. I would listen. I would try to serve. I would try to understand. And, and, and similarly, the, 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 the wife, the spouse would, would do the same and try to understand rather than just simply express your, your, your feelings and thoughts. And so it is this beautiful dance that I think can be a beautiful testimony to the world around us. And so just we wanted to provide, I think, again, some some foundations as we as we look at our marriages. And I want my life to be to respond to the grace of God. I want to do something with it. I, I don't want his grace to be without effect. And, and I want it in, to be perhaps the most effective is in my marriage, the closest relationship that I have on earth. And, and that it, it shapes and changes our dynamic and our relationship. And, and then therefore we, we have this beautiful dance together. And so, you know, perhaps some questions to ask yourself and you can, uh, you can respond in just a second, but, how, how can, perhaps, and maybe you haven't thought about this in a while, how can grace and the gospel become and have a greater impact in your life? How can you enjoy this, this dance in a better way? And then perhaps thinking of, secondly, what is your view of submission and respect to one another? How does it align with, with what we see in Ephesians 5 and Christ and the church? And is there anything that you need to change in that area? Just some, some thoughts uh, you can, you know, as you, as you perhaps discuss amongst yourselves, what, uh, you know, what are some areas we can, we can work on. But again, w this is all about marriage and the light, in light of the gospel and in light of grace.